Hey guys, welcome back to Yuki Everything. My name is Pete, and today we are kicking off our first installation of the Legacy Reviews segment here on the channel. So, if you didn't watch the last episode and you haven't heard, uh, if you've been living under a rock here on Yu-Gi-Oh! Everything, this is basically a series where I review the original three Yu-Gi-Oh! shows in Duel Monsters, GX, and 5Ds. I'm a first-timer, so I've never watched any of these shows. I'm watching them subbed, and I'm giving my fresh thoughts on them of kind of my likes and dislikes of each episode, and then at the end, I'll kind of rank uh, which one I thought of that episode since I'm doing the same number I thought were you know from best to worst uh, and kind of where the series is progressing and you know what I'm thinking about the characters and so on and so forth these reviews obviously will be pretty long uh, so there'll be timestamps down below in the description if you want to skip ahead to only watch one specific review whether it's just the GX episode or just the 5d's episode I totally understand that but if you're nice enough and you uh, feel free to be interested enough to listen to all three, I would greatly appreciate that. So without further ado, guys, we're going to start with Duel Monsters Episode 6, Gorgeous Harpy Lady. All right, so kicking off Duel Monsters Episode 6, the first time I'm reviewing Duel Monsters here on the channel. Uh, and I got to say, just being honest right off the bat... Um, wasn't my favorite episode. The first five episodes of 5D, since I didn't review them, I could give a quick little synopsis of what I was thinking. Um, I, I've really enjoyed it so far. Y Yugi definitely is the best character so far. He's the most interesting character, not just because he's the main character, but I like his whole transformation of the alter ego person that he undergoes because he has the money and puzzle. None of that's been explained yet for me, um, but I could assume, I know it's causes some split personality or so or something comes out of the millennial puzzle i don't know what it is but it definitely makes him a better or at least more confident duelist so i really liked his duel against Hagad. god that that was very interesting i thought his quips were really really good and then we get into this episode which had its had its moments that were enjoyable but overall for me i, I don't know i just found it a little boring it kind of dragged a little bit uh so like you know, the episode kicks off here where, you know, we have Pegasus, who seems to be our villain here in the first arc of the show. And he's saying that, you know, hey, Yugi boys, he always likes to say here, um, will you be able to make it to my castle? You'll be battle your way all the way there because obviously the arc going on is we're on Duelist Kingdom. We're on this island that Pegasus is basically running where he lives, assumingly. And he's having the quote unquote best duelists of, you know, I would assume around the world come in here. You got to get 10 stars to, in I think it's like 48 hours to get entry to his castle. And then at that point, it'll be the best of the best, get into the castle. And then eventually you could try to win the tournament, win prizes, win money, big deal, you know, um, kind of fame and, and, and entitlement uh, that you'll have of being, you know, the duelist probably kingdom champion. Uh, we have different motivations so far for some of these characters as we touch on the episode. So, you know, Yuki wants to win because... He wants to meet Pegasus and get his grandfather's soul back that Pegasus took in episode two. We have Junichi, um, which I, I might jump back and forth to some of the dub names because, you know, he's called Joey in the dub. So forgive me for that. But um, for now, I'll stay with the sub name of Junichi or, or Jon Jonochi. Um, he has motivations that his sister that he's basically been separated with. For a long time after their parents got divorced, she's going to go blind. And to get some very experimental surgery that's extremely expensive, he needs to win the prize money. And then you have the person that Jonoji went against in this episode, Mai, who doesn't care about any of that. And she's very vain and wants to win the money to go to Paris and buy very designer items and luxury items and kind of basically treat herself, treat her beauty because she's, you know... Everyone always compliments her beauty in the show so far, and Yuki calls that out of saying, you know, it, it, it's very, it's very vain. Uh, and when he switches to his alter ego there at the end of the duel, I thought it was very funny that he goes, oh, you know, this is going bad. Your harpies are are looking bad during the duel, and you're also your beauty is fading as this duel, uh, this duel goes on. My so I thought that was a he he has these great one liner comeback shots even when he's not dueling. So I really appreciate that. But there was, there was a few flashback scenes here for Jonochi um, throughout the episode relating to his sister. He's on the cliffside at the beginning of the episode, and his friends are like, oh, he's not taking this seriously. He thinks it's kind of a joke. What does he think he's on a field trip? But he's really thinking about the last time he's seen ocean like this, and it was with his sister of when it seems like they skip school. 
they might get in trouble, you know, they were going to risk that with their parents, but he didn't care. They were getting divorced already, and he wanted to spend as much time with his sister as he could and, and, and create a memory for her and for the two of them together. And so I thought that was a nice little flashback scene that kind of grounds him as a character because he's a little wacky. I think he's been through the first six episodes here, but it grounds him as a character of what he is fighting for. And that we touched on that through the whole episode that, you know, Yuki says, you were able to beat my because you're fighting for something way more important than what she's fighting for. She's fighting for fame. She's fighting for money, basically, to buy luxury items and, and go to Paris and take trips. And you're fighting to tr make sure your sister isn't blind, to at least give her the ability to get this very experimental surgery for the possibility that she won't be blind. Um, so I like, the, I like those themes going on throughout the episode. I, I did like the flashbacks a lot. I like uh, basically toward about two-thirds through the episode when Yuki keeps saying it's seen but it's unseen right that's the theme that they're going on it's like friendship it's there you could feel it it's seen but it's an unseen thing and that's the way Jinochi was able to figure out you know Mai's trick throughout the episode that she was using the aroma tactics of how she knew what cards were what without even turning them over because she had different perfumes which I mean you would have to have a lot a lot of perfumes and have an amazing sense of smell to like distinct your entire deck of which card is which like does every single card have a different aroma or is like spell cards this perfume and a monster card is this perfume but as they say in the episode most of her deck was spell cards and kind of trap cards and it seems like her only monster was the harpy ladies um so really weird there but you know you, you kind of let you kind of let that go because i talked to dylan um about dual monsters that in the beginning here I, you know, I don't know anything. The, the Vrains was, if you don't know, was the first Yu-Gi-Oh! show I ever watched, you know, basically start to finish. Um, I watched a little bit of, like, dub Duel Monsters back in the day, but I don't remember anything. And I'm like, it doesn't seem like it stays to the rules that the, that Vrains was or any of these other Yu-Gi-Oh! shows do. And that's because he said at that point, the card game wasn't even a thing. So they were kind of, the anime was just playing with whatever. So we had the weird things in the first five episodes of the way the field can affect you have it even in this episode where like the harpy lady can fly up and now a ground uh, cards and monsters can't attack the flying creatures like there's a lot of weird stuff going on here in the first six episodes of dual monsters but it's interesting that Genochi he has this moment as I'll get back to this as I was saying where he's figuring out Mai's whole aroma thing and he kind of closes his eyes and it calls back to his sister of when she's going to be almost completely blind. And it's the seen but unseen as he's able to figure out that trick. And I thought that was a really, that, that was honestly the only kind of touching, powerful moment was those flashbacks. And really that one in the episode. Um, the rest of it was kind of a little bit of fluff for me. You know, you have Anzu that doesn't like Mai as that's been established. Um... My clearly fascinated since the beginning with Yuki, you know, from the rumors and ends up being the truth, obviously, that he beat Kaiba in the first episode. That's a big deal. And now that he beat Haga, who is the Japanese tournament champion. So these are these are big deals as he sits at three stars. So she thinks, hey, I'll, I'll fight him later when I have more stars. So I'm not risking kicking myself out of the tournament. I'll go after someone like Genochi. He's a, he's a weak duelist. He finished the quarterfinals in a city tournament like he's nobody. He went under, what, a month of serious training with Grandpa before anything happened. And yet he's able to beat her because this this idea of believing in your friends, of of fighting for something that's more important. And I, and I like the message that it gives out. But overall in the episode, like, and as I said in the show, like you have like it depends on where you're on the island of like where the field can power up your cards. Like those are all things that I don't think are normally in the other Yu-Gi-Oh shows or in the card game. So like it kind of throws me out of it in this Duelist Kingdom first six episodes so far. Um, but I, I did want to touch on one other thing here in this in this review, as I'm kind of bouncing all over the place here, is that Yuki, when he changes to that alter ego, he's he's still behind Genochi, he's still behind his friends, but it seems like he he's the one that he's not only like cheering on his friends in Genochi here, who's the only one that out of the friends that's dueled so far beside Yuki, he seems like he gives complete advice where he's kind of helping them cheat in some ways. And I know Mai is cheating with her Roma thing, but when he went to go pick up the card for the Time Wizard and that animation happens where it looks like he does, Yuki does something with his mind to make sure that that card is there. To me, 
It could be me going crazy, but to me that means that he put that card there somehow through maybe his Millennium Puzzle powers. I don't know how any, any of that works. So he's straight up helping Genochi cheat and, and get the best cards to win. Um, so, yeah, you know, all's fair to the ends well, I guess, right? You know, if Mai isn't... Uh, if, if she isn't playing fair, uh, why should Janochi, why should Yuki even for that matter? Uh, and, you know, I, I can't disagree with that, especially when Mai is coming at them and saying like, hey, you know, you're not a true duelist, like, you know, a friend could be an enemy the next day, you know, you can only trust, and she says herself, so she's not even saying like, yourself, she's just straight up saying herself, like she's not even regarding Janochi as anyone important whatsoever and that's what triggered yuki in the first place to becoming his alter ego uh and helping Janucci. but there was just it was just a weird part of the episode and the, and the one thing like that definitely was a continuity error is that they they say when they use the time wizard that it accelerates the baby dragon to thousand years dragon web right so they clearly say thousand years then yuki says oh when the harpy ladies look old which somehow that card again weird duelist kingdom stuff so far that card affects her cards and makes them old whatever well i'll just accept that he says a million years so you just said a thousand then you said a million and then jonoji goes back to saying that's a concept you know about friendship that you want to understand in a million years so it's a thousand year dragon right and it seems like you accelerated the card a thousand years why is yugi and then and then Jonochi later saying a million years. So that, that just seemed like a continuity error of like they forgot which kind of um, term that they were using for time uh, in that moment. So I, I, I thought that was a little weird. It didn't like, you know, ruin the episode for me whatsoever. But it was just a little bit, definitely a little bit of a uh, continuity error throughout the episode. And then Jonochi wins. He beats Mai. She can't believe it. He gets the star and, you know, they're going to. They're going to move on here, I, I I would imagine, of talking about, you know, what it's going to take to win the rest of this. And, you know, what's seen remains unseen was the was the theme in the episode. But, yeah, guys, that's kind of my thoughts here on Duel Monsters uh, Episode 6, Gorgeous Harpy Lady. Uh, let me know this part of the review, uh, what you thought of Duel Monsters. Wasn't my favorite episode, but looking forward to more. Um, a little bit of, you know, backstory there. More expanding Genochi, um, and his his flashbacks were definitely the best part. But all the other stuff felt a little bit fluff to me, a little bit boring of an episode. But now I'm going to switch over to the GX review episode six. So feel free to stay tuned. Well, hey guys, welcome back to the GX episode six side of this review. This episode was titled Wing Karibo's Miracle, uh, and, and Karibo Wing Karibo has kind of been the uh, MVP so far. Uh, in GX, if you haven't heard and you're hearing it for the first time, GX is a show through the first five episodes that I found uh, incredibly odd. Um, th there's not been many moments in this show. There's at least been one moment every episode that's made me uncomfortable. Uh, and not in like a jokey kind of way, more in like a... Um, just a weird way like not that like i'm offended by it or anything just like oh that's strange that like was really weird to have in the show it's just a, a show that hasn't vibed with me um i would say through the first five or six episodes however i will say i enjoyed this episode episode six kind of the second part of this duel against this dark duelist titan versus Jaden. uh what well, Jaden, i shouldn't say as a dub name is judai you know yuki judai um judai um yes it's just a it's been an incredibly entertaining duel i would say over these two episodes it's definitely been the highlight so far for me through the first six episodes of gx uh and so we kick off here in part two in the episode where you know part two of the duel here in episode six from episode five where judai is he's dueling against this supposed dark duelist titan he's basically like a a mercenary duelist that chronos you know um you know headmaster chronos or you know you know instructor chronos who is obsessed creepily obsessed with destroying judai's reputation and getting him kicked out of uh the duelist academy he hires a mercenary is going to put up three months of his salary just to have um judai lose and where they are is they go to this like abandoned like dorm room on the duelist academy island or whatever that's supposedly haunted in the sense that dark shadow games have gone on there and many kids from the island have disappeared 
Cronus doesn't even care about his own student. That's how much he hates Judai. That he's like, oh yeah, I'll just hire a mercenary to go over there and basically kill him. I mean, who knows what happens to him really in a shadow game. Most of these people don't know because as they explained in this episode, um, since I'm only through episode 6 of Duel Monsters, when you have a Millennium item, you're able to play a shadow game, which is, uh, to me, it seems a game of death. A game where you, you go to hell, kind of, if you lose. And Kronos just is so obsessed with with killing Judai or getting kicked out of the academy. He doesn't even care if a mercenary kills him. So that's been a little messed up of his obsession um, throughout the show so far. But in facing Titan here through these two episodes here, and particularly in this episode, you know, Judai's back is against the wall. His body is literally disappearing um, from the Millennium Puzzle. You know, Yuki's Millennium Puzzle that supposedly this guy has. He's able to, you know, keep having him look into it. And more and more as his life points go down, more and more Judai feels his body slipping away. The weird thing is, as him and his friends point out, you know, that he is watching on the, on the sidelines there, is they're not all seeing the same thing so show Haito like nobody is seeing the, the same thing like hey Judai's left arm is gone oh I thought his right arm was gone like it, it's fading away disappearing and that's a persistent thing that even show goes huh we haven't been seeing the same thing for a while and that gets revealed later in the episode of what's actually happening but in the duel itself this this titan guy this dark duelist he has a fiend deck um so basically it's a very powerful deck um and someone not knowing anything about the card game they're explaining it to me as the episodes go on but it's a powerful deck but it costs life points to literally maintain the deck however titan of course has some spell card pandemonium that's able to negate those effects uh, as well so he doesn't have to take any life point damage to uh, maintain the cost of his fiends as long as he keeps monsters on the field with fiend in the name and his terra king arc fiend is is or skull king arc fiend or whatever it's called um is the main kind of uh, card he keeps bringing back. I believe he brings it back like two or three times in this episode alone after uh, Judai keeps destroying it over and over and over again. And the card is very interesting because it has this effect where anytime any effect of a monster or another card on the opponent's field uh, triggers against it, the Titan can bring out a roulette wheel, which, you know, we see Bowman and Vrains. He has the, you know, the Judgment Dice. He's using a roulette instead, and if it ends up 2 or 5, or then I think later it's like 1, 3, or 5. If it lands on any of those, the effect is destroyed. It doesn't affect Titan's monster, and it destroys the opposing, in this case, Judai's monster. So it's a very powerful effect. And we see Titan succeed with it twice throughout these first two episodes here, you know, in episode five and then in episode six. And then as uh, episode six is going on, it basically, uh, Judai going into a very dark phase. It looks like he's, you know, he's very down in his life points. He's fading away. And that's how Titan seems to be, have been winning. We see him like earlier in episode five beat this like random guy is because he's able to lull his victims down, making them fade away, and then he's able to easily beat them when they have no ability to fight back. So he's shocked when Judai is able to have this fighting spirit to fight back. He said, you know, this is most exciting duel of his life. It's really getting his, you know, his pulse pumping because there's like serious things on the line just because that's the character that Judai is. Um, you know, even Haito says, you know, you or something else, you know, Asuka is it, it, always saying like, you know, Yuki Judai is, is he's someone else uh, in, in the character that he ends up being like, he's just, he's like, he never quits, which is, a, you know, like an admirable trait, but at the same time, like he, he's so naive to some of the things going on in the world sometimes, you know, we see he doesn't care about class or anything, he just cares about doing, he's sleeping through class and show all the damn time he even had a chance to move up to uh raw yellow a couple episodes ago uh when he defeated manjome and nope he still stays in the you know the cipher uh, or siffler i think it's cipher red uh is how you say it um but no getting back to this episode here he is able to kind of power through but he's helped by wing karibo kind of bringing him back from the depths giving him that literal light at the end of the tunnel and he brings it back and titans like oh how is he back how how is he fighting back how is he doing it and it's revealed judai figures out that this whole shadow game is a hoax this whole dark game is a hoax this guy is a charlatan he's he's someone that's got to be some kind of magician he's been hypnotizing us that's why we're all seeing different things 
it's all BS. That's not even a real Millennium Puzzle. As he like throws the card at it and cracks it. And once all that is basically revealed, even though Titan was having the upper hand and it was going to be paid for beating Judai, he decides to flee. Well, that's when shit hits the fan, per se. And wherever they are here in this abandoned dorm, there is clearly dark energies here. And a real shadow game gets triggered. They go into another realm where they can only see each other. You know, I don't think Sho or Haito could see them. You know, Asuka's off there in the coffin trapped as the classic, very cliche damsel in distress. Um, which is why they went in here. You know, they went in there to have fun. But then when they found Asuka, it was also about saving her as well. Her and uh, Judai have a really weird connection. More her a fascination with Judai and also a little bit of jealousy because he's a really good duelist. And he... I think finds her pretty, but at the same time, it's more like he kind of is just chill with everyone. Like, if you're cool with him, he's cool with you, and he likes to try to help everyone out. As we've seen earlier in the show, when he helped that woman push the car up the hill, he's late to his exam, and look, that ends up paying off for him because she gives him a super rare card. Um, so that's just the type of character that I have liked in Judai so far. I have vibed with him as a character, even though he's a little bit wacko, and so is this show. But when they go into the actual shadow game, and, and only the two of them can see each other, uh, Titan is possessed. And he, kind of these hell, these demons, as they call them, take over him because he was someone who wanted to flee. And, you know, Judah even goes, what happens? He wanted to flee. And now his kind of mannerism change. You know, his eyes go red. His voice is the same, but it, it, it's spoken in a different tone. And the way he's even dueling is different. Um, and he's, it's all about finishing the shadow game that you can't leave unless both of them would be punished and be sent to hell or demons would overtake them forever for all of eternity if the game isn't finished. So Judah has no problem with that. They finish out the game. It's a lot of back and forth shots that I really enjoyed, um, of different exchanges, you know. He brings out Sparkman, he equips some kind of, uh, I forget whatever effect it was, but it gives him a gun where he has like three shots at it, and then he switches it to defense mode, and he keeps believing in Wing Karibo. And Wing Karibo, even throughout the, the episode there, when they're in, especially in the Hellspawn place, is he is keeping all the demons back to not affect Judai. So I really, I really like that. I really like all the back and forths of just like Judai had that one spell card. I think it was like emergency provisions or something where he was able to get a thousand life points. Like when they were back in the real world before it was revealed that Titan was, you know, he was a hoax, he was a charlatan. He's able to steal that with one of his spell cards back when they're in the hell spawn and he's able to recover a thousand life points. He goes back up to 1400 life points. Judai obviously at the hundred well in classic hero fashion you know he has to defeat him in the next turn and he's able to you know summon hero bubble man of course he also has the exact same spell card like bubble shuffle or something also that he's able to pull out of his hand very convenient uh and then he's able to spawn um other uh, on you know other monsters onto the field it triggers um, the roulette on the side of Titan, but this time, since he's not controlling it, he's not being the charlatan, he was, it wasn't luck, he was basically causing the roulette to land on 2 and 5, and now that he's in a real shadow game, and he's no longer in control of all his tricks, it comes up the wrong number, he's very shocked by it, and now, you know, um, Judai says, you know, kind of, your, your luck has ran out now, now that it's a real, kind of a real duel going on. So I, I kind of like that little shot that he gave, and it was nice that it was kind of a an even playing field, I would say. And another instance where we had in Duel Monsters, if you could regard um, those characters as cheating, clearly Titan here was cheating. That's how he seems to be winning all the time. Um, and then by attributing Bubble Man, he's able to get a um, another hero on the field, the issue is he, he has to have the roulette go his way, Judai. It does. And he's able to get, I believe, it was like Edge. Blade Edge, I believe, was the monster. Blade Edge, Blade Edge is able to deal an effect that the difference between the uh, attack points of the opponent's monster and Blade Edge, which is 2,600, um, you can deal that as direct damage. And, of course, in perfect fashion, the exact difference between the two opponents um, that it, you know, it exceeds the uh, points by of the opponent is 1,400. The exact thing um, that, of course, Titan has. 
and he's able to win the duel, knock Titan out, and then the demons overtake him. He learns very quickly that shadow games are completely real, and he goes off to hell. But, you know, when Link Karibo guides him back, and they go back to the real world, and they bring Asuka out, he's very naive again, Judai, in the sense of thinking, like, oh yeah, he probably just ran away. Like, you know, hey, you know, Haito's like, what's that sound? Sounds like a duel monster. Oh, where did he go? Oh, he, he just ran. Now he's probably in hell for all eternity, uh, Titan there. Like, the, you, you were playing an actual real shadow game. This dorm clearly has some some dark stuff and then you get Kronos there at the end of the episode he's he's they get Judai is completely gone he must have been scared off hey I don't even have to pay this guy but I'll collect the receipt uh, well he's gonna find out when he comes back to school um that that's not the case Asuka wakes up when they're outside and she explained the last episode um that the reason why she was really here and she comes here and she was laying the roses because her brother is one of the people one of the students that I would assume years ago disappeared here in this dorm. So there, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the dorm, and and Judah is able to save I think like the rose and the card and like his picture as well, and that means a lot to Asuka. And then they they run back to the school because it's almost daylight and they don't want to be seen gone. And again, Asuka says, you know, Yuki Judai like again is just fascinated by the type of person he is, what he does for people, and also he's just a very interesting, sometimes incredibly frustrating. Uh, character. So yeah, so guys, overall, that's kind of my uh, thoughts here on episode 6 of GX, uh, Winged Karibo's Miracle. Definitely uh, a really, really enjoyable episode. Uh, these first, these last two episodes were probably the first episodes I've really enjoyed of GX, and I really thought they were entertaining duels that in the end ended up having severe uh, actual consequences when they were playing a real shadow game as, you know, Titan went off to hell and Judai's not even aware of how serious it was so let me know what you thought down below um, I'm gonna switch over finally one more time to the 5 D's review so if you want to follow me over there please do but without further ado I'm gonna switch to that alright guys and welcome back to the final part of the review this is the 5 D's part of the review so um this is obviously as I did last episode the only show that I've reviewed up until this point, I've reviewed episode 5. Uh, and this kind of picks up where it left off uh, in this episode. This is episode 6, Look at My Treasure Deck, it is called. And that references, obviously, the, the grandpa guy that you say ends up meeting up with when he's on the way to the detention center um, in the beginning part of the episode. But the literal beginning of this episode, and I always like with 5Ds, is like, Dual Monsters usually has like a little beginning then it does like the well actually no, no no most of the time i think so far it's done the beginning of about five thousand years ago or whatever in ancient egypt it then cuts to a clip of what's going in dual monsters then the intro and then goes back to the episode gx literally just starts with the intro like it just jumps right into that then you go into the episode and it always these these three shows have the transitions in the middle of the episode which is something i don't remember from brains at, at all where it plays like a little outro music and shows like a character that's in the episode like in an intense pose with their monster in the background and then shows a separate one when it comes back. With 5Ds, it always starts with like a clip of the episode, then it goes into the intro, and then it goes into the rest of the episode. So it's just those little things that I've been finding interesting as I review and watch these episodes for the first time. You know, the, these older shows of when they were shot. And I think the Duel Monsters is like, early early like beginning of 2000 like it was, it was way then and i think uh 5ds is like 2004 2005 so and gx is obviously in the middle of that so we're talking you know this first half of the 2010s decade so it's interesting to see like what they do interesting uh animation style wise and, and just how they they edit the show in general but anyway tangent aside um, getting into the actual episode right there at the beginning, you say, uh, he's paying for his crimes. You know, last episode, as I reviewed, he was going against Jack Atlas in Duel Stadium. They were having their whole bout and then something happened. You know, the duel got interrupted. It was an unfinished duel. Some red dragon appeared in the sky. They both look like they got branded or at least you say got branded, but Jack maybe was already branded, but his lit up and they were both in pain like you say specifically said that it hurt like he was getting like branded that he could feel the burn happening uh and then we see the police you know the security show there uh, up there at the end of the episode so you know you say is going to be the one obviously in trouble jack's the king he's not going to be in trouble from the director or the company or anything else you say goes before some kind of council some kind of judging in this episode 
and he is branded again with another mark. He already had a mark on his face. He has another mark now uh, that we see from the opening. So now that makes sense of how he gets it because he is a satellite citizen trespassing in Neo Domino, uh, which is something that is absolutely 100% um, forbidden. So he gets branded. He also is sentenced to one month in the detention center of like re-education it's supposed to be. And then he's then six months where he's supposed to work in the expansion factory for Neo Domino City of what is going on. So uh, um, a lot of punishment that you say has to endure certainly from his outcome, his, his not even result with Jack. So as you say, is getting transported to his his re-education center, uh, as as they call it. I love I love when government uh, organizations and this ends up being the public like uh, safety bureau or something it's called. Um, I love when, when they when they call it these things of a re-education program. It, it's it's a it's like a concentration camp that you're sending these poor citizens that are part of this caste system uh, that you have going on between satellite that supports Neo Domino. Like the director says, Neo Domino cannot exist without satellite. Yet you just treat these people like absolute crap. So I always find that funny. Um, just, just how it, the two kind of places and how they really treat, uh, they treat the satellite citizens and how they really look down upon them. Uh, but that kind of filters in later in the episode because he meets up with this old man on the bus. I forget his name. It's like Hymura. No, that, no, that, that was the bully guy. It, it, it's something. He, he meets, he meets him on the bus, some old guy. Um, and he's interested in dueling. He, he was there. He's also a trespasser that's getting transported to the facility. Uh, it's like y Yang Gi or something his name is. I just looked it up. So something like that. You could, you know, label the pronunciation down below for me. Um, but he was also there and seeing that, you know, there was a red dragon in the sky, that the lights went out everywhere and kind of usually trying to ask him like, hey, what do you know about this? What, what's going on? He really doesn't have any answers for Yusei whatsoever. He's just talking about how incredible it is and kind of very GX. Like, he keeps calling him bro, kind of how show calls um, Judai bro. So that that was, you know, kind of an interesting callback or just kind of a weird, maybe a cultural thing that they have in Japan where they're always calling people bro. I don't know. Maybe you could explain it to me further. But that, that was something I caught on. Uh, it then cuts to Jack. He's waking up. The, the director assistant, I forget her name, she says that, you know, she, he's been out since this morning. Jack wants to know what the hell's going on. He goes all the way to the public maintenance department, I think it's called, where that crazy scientist, that other lady, and the director are all watching their high-def clips until the power went out of what happened. And so even though the subtitles keep saying the moments, the moments rotation, the moments power, you guys told me down below... I was reading, I do read your comments uh, last episode, even if I don't have time to respond to them all. Um, and it's supposed to be momentum, even though for whatever reason the Crunchyroll sub is moment. So I will say momentum. So whatever they're, they're building here, whatever they're researching with this momentum, it has to do with now we find out this ancient crimson dragon, which is the thing we saw. It seems like the thing that they are trying to revive. And it seems that the conditions that are necessary for it were not when Jack's like um, I think Arc Fiend or whatever dragon comes out. It's only when that dragon and Stardust Dragon actually collided with each other. When when they actually fought each other in Duel Stadium, that was uh, the Red Dragon Arc Fiend. That was the necessary conditions to bring out this ancient Crimson Dragon, which seems to be at least one of the reasons of why they're doing what they're doing and researching momentum uh, at the facility. But Jack kind of basically comes in, crashes the party. Hey, why are you looking at this? Hey, what's going on here? He wants to know some detail. Uh, and the director, the, the way the director is very interesting, he handles him uh, literally just that. He handles Jack. He needs Jack in some way, and I'll talk about more of what he said uh, in a couple minutes. But he treats him like like a celebrity, like someone that he needs, but he also wants to coddle, and he doesn't want to upset too much, and he wants to handle him and control him and prevent him of what he's seeing and what he's hearing, uh, and that's why he tries to have his assistants always on Jack, always trying to keep him from the facility or, or give the director some kind of warning. So it, it's weird. It's like 
he respects him and he needs Jack, but at the same time, he wants to be the one in charge. So I think that's a very interesting dynamic that's kind of building that Jack is at least not naive. He's not so far. He's aware that the director is holding back on things. And I think even when the director spills some of those those beans, per se, he still knows that the director is hiding things. So jumping back to going to the 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 tension facility basically very interesting scene happens r early on so you say they tell them hey you know you're scanning the system you're basically this number and a letter now and they, they list it out but you have this interesting shot where it says you know you say fudo is his name date of birth unknown age 18 his sex is male obviously address unknown question marks against the occupation and the career birthplace height weight and blood type all unknown so almost nothing nothing is known about Yusei Fudo whatsoever he is someone from satellite um Jack said that he also saw Yusei had a brand that he didn't have two years ago that he has now but nobody knows anything about him um so I think that's very interesting that we're gonna kind of peel back I would assume we're gonna peel back the mystery of Yusei as we go through this entire show but I thought that was a little cool shot here as he was kind of getting scanned into the facility. And then in classic Yu-Gi-Oh fashion, you know, you go in there and, you know, there's a hierarchy system about duelists. It's very, you know, low-key underground. Like, it's not in the detention facility. Like, hey, here's the, the listing of who's the best duelist. It's not anything like a duel academy situation. It's more of like an underground thing. Even the guard itself lets out that high mirror guy or whatever, the bully guy who used to be a pro duelist, lets, lets him out and kind of roughs up the new prisoners, uh, per se. But the way you rough them up is through dueling. You know, I mean, that, that, that's kind of classic Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, one of the other punishments, too, you say, lost his D-wheel, his second D-wheel after Jack took his first one, and took his deck. So now he has nothing coming in. Good thing the old geezer, as they say, he, he has collected and amassed a deck over time, uh, and he has some kind of uh, protection whatsoever. So, Yusei keeps asking questions to the geezer about the red dragon or whatsoever. Geezer doesn't know anything, just keeps asking him about, hey, did you bring a deck? Hey, I've been in enough of these facilities that I know this is kind of how things roll. You cut back to what's going on, uh, the very interesting stuff going on in the public health, the public maintenance department, where Jack crashes the party there, as I said. But they explained to Jack that, um, hey, you're a uh, you're a, something called a signer. Um, you're someone of the stars. You're, as per se, what the legend is. You're someone, a, a god almost. Like, you walk the path of the stars. And that's why your mark is there. And everyone, including the director, kind of puts their hand over their chest and they show Jack a sign of respect. Which I thought was very odd where they, they want to be the ones in power, especially the, the director, yet... They still respect Jack and clearly need him, and maybe he is a godlike figure. They, the director literally says, you are the chosen one, you are a person of the stars, you're a signer. Jack was completely unaware of this, and then points out that, hey, you say I had this mark too. And the director's like, wait, that guy from Satellite, a satellite person had a mark? Maybe his means a signer mark as well? They didn't know that because the footage, well, A, because he's a satellite person, so they haven't been researching him, but also the footage cut out after the whole power outage when this red, ancient red crimson dragon came out. So Jack obviously wants to know more information, wants to know exactly where Yusei is. He didn't have this mark two years ago, and they tell him, hey, it's standard procedure. He's no different. He's in the, de the detainment facility, and Jack wants to go after him. A little bit before that, though, Jack finds out, as you guys pointed out, that I was going to find out the answer to my question. He finds out that, hey, he was going to use the end of the storm, which, you know, destroys all monsters on the field. It's 300 damage per monster. You say was going to run out of life points because Jack had 1,000 left or 900 left before Jack ran out. However, it's revealed that you say had a, a, a trap card or a spell card, a Meteor Stream. A Meteor Stream, um, as they explain is basically so he you know he activates his field the speed speed spell that would take all the 300 points but with meteor stream even though the strategy was to get stardust back and that was jack's idea to have you say release stardust from his field and bring it back to jack's field the issue is when a, a monster is resurrected 
after it's been released from your opponent's field with a meteor stream you take a thousand damage directly and he only had 900 life points which means that you say was going to win this duel and that shatters jack it shatters jack's ego and it feeds into his obsession with wanting to be the best and also his rivalry um with you say that hey i beat you say two years ago you say no matter how good the duel was and even though it got interrupted he would have technically beat me and the director goes hey don't worry about it you know nobody's seen this there's no footage on this it doesn't matter and jack goes it matters to me the king will remember the king is not going to forget this moment and so i i, I definitely think he, he will meet up with you saying the next probably couple episodes he, he might even go to that detainment facility find a way pull some strings to get him out of there and if it is true that he is some kind of signer maybe you say is as well so th that will be that will be very very important to kind of monitor that situation going forward um, you cut back to the detention facility and, you know, the, the pro duelist guy attacks the grandpa and challenges to, to a duel. Grandpa realizes that, hey, you ain't basically shit. Um, if you're not trying to duel, not trying to up your rank here in this facility, that's just how it is. The grandpa has a lot of rare cards. A lot of the people supporting, you know, High Miro, whatever his name is, the pro duelist, they're very awed and like, hey, tell him to watch his back. This is very rare cards. You know, they're really buying into the hype of this old geezer. Yet, he really doesn't know how to do it all. He doesn't even know his own cards whatsoever. Um, and he basically flounders. He gets made fun of. They, He gets wiped the floor with. I mean, the guy was a pro duelist, so it, it's not that surprising. Um, he, he'll have some interesting price story going forward because he was a pro duelist that nobody wants to talk. He doesn't want his past talked about. So interesting to how he fell from pro duelist into a detainment facility with a bunch of satellite rejects and horrible criminals throughout society that are all branded and marked. How did he get there? How did he fall from grace? Um, it goes to the end of the episode where the moment happens where he's making fun of the grandfather. Hey, you don't know anything. He's stomping on his cards and the grandfather's pleading like, hey, I don't know a lot of things, but I am someone that, you know, I just want to learn about the history of humans through these cards. I cherish them a lot. You know, please respect that. I didn't mean any insults. He's really, the guy's being a dick. And you say, the boy you say comes over, doesn't care whatsoever and just leg sweeps this man, takes him down, knocks him over, and he asks the he asks the old guy, hey, can I use your deck? And, you know, the uh, pro duelist, the high mirror guy is asking him, you know, what the hell do you think you're doing? And he's going, hey, if you're such a pro duelist, you can duel me, and I'm going to use this deck. And this guy's like, oh, you're going to use that pathetic, you know, weakling deck? And he's like, I think, you say goes, any card at all has meaning. It just depends on like how you use them whatsoever, and that really appeals to the grandfather because you know the, the the old geezer guy because those cards mean a lot to him. It was a very noble thing and kind of a badass thing uh, that you say says. He actually specifically says of the numerous cards in existence, there's not a single useless card. So it kind of wraps up into this theme of the heart of the cards, believing in your cards, as we've seen through these three shows. That if you believe in what you are playing you can win no matter what. And yes, you have some plot armor as the main characters, but I, I like that theme going through. And, I, and I, I like how you say is a very proactive individual who protects the weak. He protects the people that are less fortunate. He did that at Satellite, and he's doing for this old man that he barely knows. So overall, guys, a very, very entertaining episode in 5Ds. I would say out of the three, if you haven't gotten the impression, if you've listened to all three so far, GX, probably my favorite episode six, then 5Ds, and then a probably distant uh, episode six in Duel Monsters, but still what did still had its moments, I would say, in Duel Monsters. So guys, thanks for listening very much. Please let me know all your thoughts down below of Duel Monsters, GX, 5Ds. If you listened to one, two, all of them, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. I would love to talk to you guys down below about, you know, theories, predictions. I obviously understand that these shows are very old, so please be careful. Do not be listing spoilers down below, otherwise I will stop. I will have to stop reading the comments, so please be respectful of me of that. Um, it makes the uh, reviews better and just makes my experience better, and hopefully your experience better if I do not know what is coming, even in the next episode. I would greatly appreciate that, but let me know what you were thinking in those moments 
um, when you were watching the shows, or maybe, hey, you're re-watching. I saw a lot of you guys say you were re-watching the shows because of these reviews, um, or maybe you're watching them for the first time with me, so please tag along, uh, talk to me about it. I would love to hear your thoughts. Stay uh, tuned to the channel for more legacy reviews that will be coming. They'll be in this exact format. Probably episode 7 sometime later this week uh, for Dual Monsters GX and 5Ds. And until then, guys, stay tuned to the channel for live streams, other videos that Dylan will have coming out. And until next time, thanks for watching.